Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you new series. New series about who is Mr. Putin? Where did he come from? From which gray obscurity did he rise to threaten the lives of everybody on this planet? How did we get here? That and more in this new series. Who is Mr. Putin? They were created by an independent production, Acute Angle, and they've been known to Russian-speaking audience for quite a while now. And we are bringing that to a wider audience in English. Enjoy. He bought there, I think, two violins, two cellos. I'd ask Crooks and such to keep calm. Sergei Pavlovich doesn't have anything left, because to buy these instruments, he spent more money than he actually had. Reserves of the central bank, or so-called federal international reserves, Many ask the question about the ideological roots of Putinism in Russia. Where did such a specific ideology and government management style originate from? Some look for the roots in USSR, in Soviet KGB, some in the criminal world, among the mafia. However, only two years before Putin's ascendance to power in Russia, an African county disposed of a dictator, who was an undeniable ideological precursor to Vlad. Only in Russia we have Putinism, while there they had Malbotism. Acute Angle presents We have a country of enormous opportunities, not only for the thieves, but also for the government. It's better to die from hunger than to be a rich slave of colonialism. It sank. Zaire is the country that suffered from colonials the most. Constant pointing at other countries as the source of our troubles is wrong, deeply wrong. I tell you that we would not like to have the same democracy as in Iraq. Mafia is not a Russian word. Frankly, when I saw those white ribbons for the first time, I thought it's some anti aid event. As a leader, Here's an eagle soaring high, and the speed of scum cannot reach him. Am I a pure-blood democrat? Of course, I'm an absolute democrat. I am the only one. There is not another one like me in the world. There is nobody to talk to after the death of Mahatma Gandhi. Imagine that even I get rusty water coming out of pipes once in a while. If you are stealing, steal only a little bit. When you steal a lot and get rich unrighteously, you will absolutely get caught. Everything that hinders our path forward should be cleared away and forsaken. The story of one dictator. The term kleptocracy. Kleptocracy means the rule of thieves. It is thought to have been coined in 1819 by an English poet and literary critic, Lee Hunt. He wrote a small article, Ancient and Modern Thieves, dedicated to the images of various thieves in European literature. He has inserted this word into the text to pretty it up. There was nothing about politics and corruption in this article, just some literary critique. Hunt's world initially forgotten. It was remembered only about 150 years later, when ex-colonies in Africa started to obtain independence one after another. One big country, rich in mineral resources called Zaire, also known as Democratic Republic of Congo. A dictatorship regime came to power in 1960s to stay for 30 years, ruled by some Joseph Mobutu. Actually, he was known as Joseph Desiree Mabutu only when he came to power. Later, he ordered to call himself Mabutu Sase Seko Kuku Ngbengo Wazabanga, what means approximately Great Warrior Mabutu advancing from victory to victory and leaving fire behind. Only the real life, the Great Warrior Mabutu was going from offshore to offshore, stealing everything along his way. Some time ago, Zaire was a Belgian colony. 
Belgium was harvesting gold, diamond, uranium, timber, non-ferrous metals. Later Belgians left and Mabutu enthroned himself. Under local management the corruption left colonial times far behind. Mabutu has beaten Belgians. So then, to give any classification to this regime, designed to steal their national resources, Western media remembered the term kleptocracy, in this case as a form of government regime. Marshal Mabutu Sesesiko Kuku Ngbendu Wazabanga. He ruled Zaire in 1965-1997 years span, and he has stolen at least five billion dollars or two annual GDPs of his country. In the meantime, Zaire, during all the years of his rule, belonged to the least of the poorest countries on earth, according to the United Nations, and it still is the country of slums and hellish poverty. Mountains of resources are exported from Zaire. Ocean cargo ships loaded daily in its ports. Everything leaves these people behind. A typical picture for the third world country. But in his time, the hustler was super successful. This is the photo of Mabutu in 1989, on the 24th year of his reign. As it is customary in these countries, he kept his money in the West, predominantly in Switzerland. He also liked Liechtenstein for this purpose. The laws in those days allowed for almost complete obscurity of depositors' identity via numbered accounts and anonymous trust. Mabuto was also a big connoisseur of elite property. He had 11 palaces in Zaire and also about 30 villas around the world. Villa in Savigny, Canton Vaux, Swiss Riviera, a castle near Brussels, personal seven-floor hotel in the center of Paris on Avenue Foch. He visited it a couple times a month for shopping with his family. For these trips he specifically rented a supersonic Concorde. And of course a true gem of his collection, Via del Mare, on Côte d'Azur, located in Roque Brun Cap Martin. Avenue Imperatrice Eugenie Yuan. This is one of the most expensive villas in the world. Main building 17,000 square feet. Guest house eight and a half thousand square feet, three swimming pools and seven and a half acres garden, everything lavishly decorated, and there is even a private helipad so that the owner could come and go unnoticed. When Mabutu was toppled in 1997, this villa was arrested by the order of new powers. Later this arrest warrant was dismissed, and it was purchased by Lushkov's Moscow mayor, in those years friend, Shava Chigirinsky, for 230 million euro. He renamed it Villa Marina Irina. Later in 2010, it was taken from him as a debt payment by some guys from Gazprom Oil. But of course, not to subsidize the company's workers' vacation plan options. Villa was transferred under anonymous offshores, and it became a favorite vacation spot of Miss Kabaeva. Ex Mabutu's villa on Côte d'Azur, a symbol of African corruption. And not only African. Kleptocracies of the world unite. Part 2. Mabutism. However, one should not think that Mabutu was some primitive thief who stole anything which was poorly guarded. No, he was also a bright and rather successful demagogue of the African nationalism. 80% of Zaire population consists of Bantu tribes. More than a half of them could neither read nor write. A special ideology was developed for these people, Mobutism, which successfully served for 30 years as a smokescreen for Zaire kleptocracy. 24 hours a day, Mabutu did not come off the TV screens, contemplating the greatness of Zaire under his management, about Africanization of power, which in earlier rough colonial times belonged to whites only, and now to the whole people. Another favorite theme was an African identity, Bantu spirituality. This was Mabutu's favorite theme. We were the colony of Western countries, but we have not become Western people. We are Bantu and we remain Bantu. We have our own traditions. For example, the respect to the leader is sacrosanct. 
You cannot toy with the leader. If the leader made a decision, he made a decision, and that's how things will be. From the interview of leader Mabutu to the Western media. Kleptocracy by itself is a shameful form of government and does not paint the people living under it in any good light. Hence, nationalism beyond the official is danger to these regimes. However, Mabutu put it at the service of his power. And it worked. For a while. Kinshasa, Zaire's capital, 1975. The apogee of Mobutu's reign. Street Banner says, I am proud to be black. I am proud to be Zairean because I am a militant in my party movement for the revolution. It is Mobutu's party, a local equivalent of Russia United. This move is used an awful lot by third world dictatorships. The country is privatized by some Mobutu and his clan. People do not decide anything, but they are offered reasons to be proud of. Being black, being Uzbek, being a native, etc. And persuaded to join the party of United Zaire, where they are taught to love motherland. However, Mabutu's party was not the main instrument of his power. The real all-powerful org was his secret police, also called NDC, National Document Center. People there were hired predominantly from Mabutu's own tribe, Ngbandi. Initially, this tribe was settled in a small rural area near equator. However, Mabutu moved them into capital in great numbers and posted everywhere, everywhere he could. Special investigations, Ngbandi, relatives and also a bunch of other friends from equator region became the foundation of his ruling clan. God sent us our prophet, our precious leader, Mabutu. He is our messiah. Angulo Mpongo, their Minister of Internal Affairs. Mabutu's childhood friend from Equator. The clan, glued by common thievery, was heavily backing their messiah. Mabutu described his ruling power as such. When I need one million dollars, I call upon my prime minister and tell him about it. Prime minister then calls the minister of finance and tells him that he needs two million dollars. Minister of finance calls the regional governor and tells that he needs three million dollars, and so on. Ultimately, I get my million, and everyone else is happy too. Sakombi Inongo, Mabutu's former Minister of Information after their government demise, gave an interview to a Belgian documentary maker about Mabutu. Ex-minister was not too shy to tell that they all were stealing while in the government, how Mabutu regulated the cash flows, so that the most money would go to the inner circle, to the family and very trusted persons, but so that the rest would also have a chance to get some. And yet Mabutu was still having fears about his future. In December 1989, in a faraway Romania, the people have toppled their dictator, Ceausescu, who immediately was executed together with his wife. When Ceausescu was executed with his wife Elena by firing squad, I put this video on air, and my god, I immediately got a phone call from Mabutu. He was beside himself. He verbally attacked me in the most vicious manner. I think that after watching this execution, he feared to get himself into such a predicament, as he was basically treating their people in the similar way as Ceausescu treated Romanians. From the memories of Ministry Nongo, fear or not, but Mabutu could not stop. By the end of 70s, the amount of money stolen by him and his equatorial inner circle was so high that Marshall started to lose his marbles. Mabutu came from a very poor family. His parents worked as servants to the Belgians. Dad was a cook, mother worked as maid. When he got whole country to rule, the son of cook and housemaid lost it. The palaces and villas were not enough. He conceived the most grandiose project he could. Gbadalite. Gbadalite is his home village in the deep forests of the northern border. A humongous marble-clad palace was built there, also known as Versailles in the jungle. 15,000 square meters of lux space, fountains, Ludwig XIV-style furniture. It was serviced by over a thousand people. This palace came with 700 hectares of parklands, international airport for concords nearby, new five-star hotels for guests, electric power generating station on the Ubangi River. This area had no electricity prior. Gbadalete village had turned from a small settlement in the jungle into a blooming town built from scratch. Mabuto's Versailles was completed by 1987. 
at a hefty price tag of about 400 million United States dollars. It's about 1 billion in today's value. Mabutu with his large court spent a lot of time there. It was a real royal palace, with receptions and parties taking place on a daily basis. 10,000 champagne bottles were brought here annually from France. Mabutu those days seldom ever traveled to Kinshasa, the real capital. Most ambassadors and leaders of other countries came to Badalite. Everything came to an end in 10 years, in 1997. The regime was toppled, Mabutu fled. The palace now is forsaken and overgrown with jungle. Same as the town. Humongous amounts of their money spent on this whim of a dictator. They were stolen from the country and just flushed down the drain. However, in 2010, Gbadalite got a sister village in Russia, Praskavievka village, near Gelenjik. There, in the middle of 68 hectares nature preserve forests, a mega palace was built, with an estimated cost of $1 billion. Sergei Kolesnikov, a businessman from a lower group of Putin's aides, was in charge of this project. In 2010, he emigrated from Russia and revealed more details about the funding for this Putin's Guadalete. Apparently, it was mostly funded through bribes and paybacks from the medical budget. The palace was built instead of hospitals, renovations and equipment purchases. All roads leading to it are protected by FSO, Russian equivalent of Secret Service. The owner visits several times a year, usually on a helicopter, sometimes on a yacht. The yacht is called Olympia. It is docked for the most part of the year in Sochi, not far from residence Bacharov Spring. This yacht is flying rather curious flag, Cayman Islands. According to Dmitry Skarga, ex-director of Soviet commercial fleet, Olympia was presented to Putin by Abramovich, Russian oligarch, in 2002 as a bribe. Dmitry Skarga was taking care of the yacht transfer from port in Europe to Sochi. The price tag of this toy is $50 million. It is owned by an offshore company based in Cayman Islands, a small Caribbean archipelago in the vicinity of Honduras. On the 6th of August 2011, Olympia near Putin's private palace in Praskovievka. Putin with Medvedev and guests came for some R&R. Speedboat is taking passengers to the shore. Later they will build a pier so that a mega yacht could actually dock closer. The yacht is guarded by two navy ships and several FSO cutters. That day the visit any ocean activity. The day of the visit, any ocean activity was prohibited in the area. Not even fishing boats could leave ports to avoid any interference with the new Russian czars. It is funny proposition, of course. Russian president has a private mega yacht in Sochi, gifted to him as a bribe. He takes it to a palace built with bribes. The yacht has a Cayman port registry where it is owned by Putin's offshores. This, my friends, is called kleptocracy. Africa is much closer than you think. Part 3. Spiritual unity of Bantu Just like Putin, Mabutu during his time in power was also arranging elections, periodically, to formally extend his authority. In our African tradition, there can only be one leader. Has anyone ever seen the village with two chieftains? He would ask his people. Of course, they have not seen anything like it and they voted to elect him for yet another term. Although Mabutu was more creative in the technological aspect of this process. While they had only him as a single candidate on the ballot, there were two ballots, green and red. Green was for peace and unity. Red was for change and disorder. One had to choose the color to vote with and put it into an urn in front of everyone. No mail-in or distant voting was allowed. This ingenious approach did not even need any machinations, with extra votes or tweaking of software systems. Mabutu was regularly obtaining close to 100%. For example, in 1970, only 157 people voted against him in the whole country of about 20 million people. We don't have opposition. I do not even know how to tell you. We are Bantu. Mabutu was telling foreign journalists after elections. 
Of course, there was opposition, under different banners and ideas, but it did exist. However, Mabutu's Bandestan did not take it kindly. For example, one of the opposition leaders, Pierre Mulele, when arrested by Mabutu's thugs, was tortured. They gouged his eyes and castrated him first, then cut off his hands and legs. That's how he died. Our Zair, single-party system, in fact, is the highest form of democracy. From Mobutu speeches. The propaganda of Mobutism, African identity and torch of opposition was successfully accompanied by Mobutu's acts of primitive self-aggrandizement. No, he did not fly with cranes or fish for pike, but some things were similar. Kinshasa, the capital of Zaire, 1974. Grand sports show for everyone. Mabutu paid for the fight of a century to be held in Zaire for the title of heavyweight world boxing champion. Both contenders are African Americans and Mabutu is posing with them everywhere. Here Mabutu shows his hand-carved staff with eagle to Muhammad Ali. This staff is an important element. Mabutu always had it with him. A similar kind of staff was carried by Mwatayan, ruler of Landa Empire, situated in the basin of Congo River in 16th-19th centuries. This was a symbol of their power. Another symbol of power in Congo was a leopard skin. Check out the garment on Mabutu's head. By wearing this particular item, he tried to underscore that he is not some Joe Schmo dictator, but a czar, Mwat Yav, with eagles. Occult practices of all sorts are rather popular among Bantu. People believe in witchcraft, spirits and sorcery. Mabuto's staff was rumored to have magic properties. That ten strong men can lift it. But the leader carries it with ease, as he is gifted with magic powers. All this obscurantism had successfully served the regime. Mabuto himself also believed in magic. From Guinea and Senegal, he brought two teams of supposedly powerful sorcerers, well known throughout Africa. They gave him advice about internal and external policies, helped to prop his cult among Zaire citizens. Mabutu was never stingy with sorcerers and paid them hefty from Zaire's budget. Local wars were one more way to acquire popularity for Mabutu. He was savvy in this kind of PR as well. In 1983, Mabutu, with a raised staff, and his friend, the dictator from Chad, his son Habre, in white. This is from the local war between Chad and Libya, where Mabutu interjected himself on the side of Habre, a tough leader with staff posing with tough war fighters. These days Habre is serving a life sentence for 40,000 murders committed by his regime under his rule. Gaddafi, with whom he fought wars, was also toppled and lynched. Mabutu, who fought on the side of Habre, was toppled, fled and died in exile. The lives of dictators are full of unexpected events. Part 4. The Fall of Regime By the end of 1980s, things for the tough guy, Tsar and sorcerer Mabutu were not going too well. Having impoverished his country with constant stealing, having created an awful investment climate, he brought upon an economic crisis. Up to 20% of their budget were spent on dictator and his government. While Mabutu was swimming in riches, lower levels of society were completely destitute. Serious problems were also brooding on the borders. Mabutu liked to poke his neighboring countries and take active sides in all kinds of their squabbles. Ultimately, this caught up with him. 
1996, on the far eastern side of Zaire, an anti-Mobutu uprising flared up. It was led by Laurent Kabila, an old leader of opposition. For over 30 years he kept fighting with Mobutu's regime from exile. The moment these rebels secured some territory, they were immediately supported by several neighboring countries, which Mobutu was not in good relations with. Rwanda, Uganda and the others. The rebels began a wider offensive, and Zaire's army, which Mobutu was relying upon, turned out to be unwilling to die for his regime. Rebels were often greeted as rescuers. So after about six months of civil war, Mobutu's troops fled, and rebels took the capital with triumph. Many of Mobutu's supporters were lynched on the streets. One could only wonder, where did those 99% of voters that he was constantly getting for over 30 years disappear? Kinshasa, the capital of Zaire, May 1997. People supporting rebels are out on the streets, celebrating victory. Dictators' portraits are burned everywhere. More of Kinshasa at the time of revolution. Captured Mobutu supporters are on the ground before execution. People with arms are the rebels. By the way, among the suppliers of these weapons was Victor Boot. He traded weapons for diamonds. He also supported Mobutu for as long as the dictator could pay. Money is money. It was in fact Victor Boot whom Mobutu turned to when he needed to book a plane for his hasty escape. Russian military intel mafia that supported Boot was making profits from both sides of conflict. Here is Victor Boot and his movie character, performed by Nicolas Cage. Lord of War, 2005. A good movie, although Cage's character, with his ethical worries about the lives of Africans, has very little to do with real Victor. Mobutu got his plane in the nick of time. It was even shot at while on the runway. Yet it managed to take off and get him to Togo, a small African country where Mobutu had a dictator friend. Mobutu asked for a political asylum from France. It was denied. Then he moved to Morocco, where he later died. All of Mobutu's elite, including dictator's family, also made a run for the borders. They had already saved enough money for free living. In the meantime, the country, which they ruled for so many years, was left with scraps. Epilogue We can talk about similarities between Mobutism and Putinism at length. There are plenty of parallels, indeed. Putin's regime, combined of criminal and government powers, has fully matured by now, and it's not going any time soon. They will likely cling to power, like Mobutu's gang, to the very end, until their planes will be also shot at during takeoff, if they will have anywhere to run. Putin's regime has no analogues in the earlier history of Russia. This is not USSR, and not an empire of Romanovs. It is a new formation, somewhat of a caricature, but also cruel and dangerous, as any third world dictatorship. The main political conflict in Russia is very simple. It is a struggle between those who want to live in Bantustan and those who do not who do not want to be treated in Congo-like hospitals, who do not want to be driven on these Congo-like roads, who refuse to listen to propaganda about the undertakings of Kremlin Mobutu. How many fishes and amphoras did the leader catch, and whom did he help to get up? His billionaire friends, most likely.
Продолжение следует.